So I'd like to welcome everyone in the room and online to the Accelerating Energy Decarbonization press conference at the very first Sustainable Development Impact Summit. Today, sitting beside me, I have Laila Tretikov, CEO of TerraWatts Initiative, Wilfred Loriano Dorego, a partner at KPMG, and Harold Hirschhofer. Perfect. <laughs> Senior advisor at TCX Investment. So today, we're <coughs> talking about accelerating clean and affordable energy. And we are having this press conference during UNGA week. So we have all these leaders. What are the ways that we can take actionable outcomes and move this <coughs> SDG forward? Well, thank you, thank you, Alan, for your question. Thank everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. I think uh, if we look at the big picture, we're at a fundamentally uh, different place in the history of humanity. For the first time since um, since we became humans, we have the opportunity to really look forward. Because even though we don't have enough data, we have enough to understand what is going to happen. And not only that, we even capable not only of predicting what's going to happen, but also changing the trajectory of our own development. But that said, we're also at the same time at a point, at a critical point, because the next 20 years, how, what actions are we going to take in the next 20 years are going to change the Earth for the next 100,000 years. So the, the level of <laughs> accountability on us is, is enormous. And one wonderful thing that has happened is that countries actually, well, most countries, uh, have come together uh, around the Paris Agreement and around the Sustainable Goals. And we have quite robust set of objectives as it comes to climate. The problem with is, is that right now, even though we have the objectives, we don't have the tools to actually implement on those objectives. And what we do, have, we do see now is that we're already behind. Even if we just look at the objective for the Paris Agreement um, that set, uh, one of the objectives was 2.5 terawatt of clean energy, of solar energy by 2025, we're not even at 5% of that. We're accelerating, but we need to move much, much faster. Why? Because it's our problem, it's my problem, it's your problem, everybody in this room, our children, it's a problem that's bigger than any one country, bigger than any one continent, it's the size of the Earth, it's, a, it's an Earth-sized problem. So we need to have Earth-sized solutions for this problem, which means we need to bring all of the stakeholders and we need to design solutions that are really massively scalable. And as we heard in the previous session, scalable enough to really create liquidity around it, around Three, on, a, on order of three trillion dollars, US dollars. So this is what Terawatt is all about, and that's why, um, if you have this this uh, um, uh, page, you'll see what are some of the organizations that come together around Terawatt to deploy these solutions. So it's um, large uh, organizations that are enterprises, large businesses. There are 16 countries that are now behind Terawatt, uh, and uh, so the policymakers and uh, their NGOs and civil society members. So that's really critical for us to all come together and, and, and look at the problem as a whole. The, as we move forward, you have to understand and we have to remember that at the end of the day, uh, it's an economic transition. We're transitioning from the world that is geared up over the last 100 years for carbon-based economy. And we, in the next 20 years, we need to fully decarbonize. How do we do that? Typically, when we look at economic transitions, I grew up in the Soviet Russia in the 80s. And what happened to Soviet Russia? The economy collapsed when, uh, uh, when the country tried to transition. We see this in the 2008 crisis. We see this uh, during big, uh, big wars. You know, it's always the same. Well, Earth is too big to fail. If we look at what is already happening with <coughs> the hurricanes, uh, Harvey, Irma, happening 
right under right here on, in the United States. We have droughts in Africa. We have floods in Asia. Earth is too big to fail. We cannot afford this kind of failure, so we need to act now. So there are three constituents and three major legs to developing the tools that we're developing. One is the policy tools. And we're lucky enough to have some of our partners here with us. And, um, uh, and they can talk a little bit about how do I address the issue of policy, changing policy in many, many countries around the world that fundamentally act independently. Uh, how do we standardize the market? And ultimately, how do we unlock the financial markets around creating a solution and, and, and around mobilizing trillions of dollars uh, going forward? So, um, so that, that, those are our, uh, our big questions. And uh, what I want to do is I want to um, invite my, uh, my co-panelists here to speak a little bit more about how the, the, the policy um, how can we understand the policy? How can we address the policies globally? Uh, thank you, Leila. Uh, I guess um, in order to figure out the importance of policy, just imagine uh, a country where there is uh, no policy, there is no legal standards, meaning that uh, there is no rules to guide investors, and there is no effective dispute resolution mechanism. Imagine another country where you do have a policy and legal standards, but they are not effective. Meaning that if, for instance, you need, you have on paper that you can complete a permitting processes in about six months, actually, in reality, it could take more than six years to complete. And thirdly, uh, imagine a country where you do have effective uh, policies and legal standards, but they are not stable. For, ex for example, if you have an investor who enter into a solo market and at a given feed-in tariff, uh, which make all his calculation around this feed-in tariff. And this has been subsequently uh, questioned by the state. So in all these three examples, what you see actually is uncertainty. And if we want to make energy affordable, we need to attract private sector. And we only attract private sector if we uh, are able to make uh, the whole thing transparent because long-term investors, they reflect uncertainty into risk premium and it makes the cost of capital more expensive. So this is an opposite of what we're trying to achieve. So that's why it is important. Policy is important. So basically, I would say, Laila, if I, <laughs> I respond directly to your question, if we want to accelerate uh, the rate at which we convert to renewable, we need uh, policy and legal standards that first have to start, standards which are credible because investors need to know, uh, uh, they need to know uh, uh, that there's no artificial support to uh, the market and they need, I mean, this policy and standard need to be stable. Mm -hmm. So basically, if we do have that, that could be a good move to accelerate the move to transition because this will contribute to make uh, uh, clean energy affordable. But this will cannot be achieved if we don't have a strong mobilization of private sector and private sector altogether. Wilfred, can you... Um uh, tell us a little bit about how you yourself, as a partner of KPMG, as a as a board member uh, in France, are engaged with Terawatt. What what solutions are you building there? Okay, uh, le let me start first with uh, why KPMG is involved. As you said that before, um, today more than ever, uh, the climate change issue is an issue for everyone. Is an issue for you. It's an issue for me. 
and I think it's an issue for all of us here individually. It's also an issue for governments, sorry, uh, for organizations. KPMG is an organization which uh, employ approximately 200,000 people around the world. So it is important that we are committed to make, to participate to the, uh, to the solution to make our planet great again. So that's why KPMG is part of the Arawati Initiative. Now, in concrete terms, how do we contribute to the program? We, KPMG, uh, again, is um, an accounting, auditing, and advisory service firm. So we, are, uh, uh, we operate over 150 countries. And, and, uh, and we have international network and very strong presence in the energy sector. So our core competence is really is, is quantification and make the link between what is regulation and quantification. When you know what is the impact of regulation, it is easier to, 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 it, it is easier to manage and to see what regulators need to do in order to bring costs down. So basically what we, we, we're doing is to contribute to build a tool which purpose is to make the correlation between regulation, uncertainty, cost, and the impact on uncertainty on cost to cost of capital, and then to the cost of energy. This tool, in order to build that, we really, what we've done is simple. We, uh, we took all the solar uh, technical parameters and we add to that a, a, a kind of uh, 21 uh, regulatory criteria that a task force we work with consider critical and because if they change, they can have a strong impact on the, the way investors perceive the, uh, the, 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 the risk of each country and ultimately the impact on the cost of capital. Why cost of capital? Because it's a key component of the cost of energy. Yeah, what I find particularly fascinating, uh, fascinating with the work that we've done so far is that we can now look at a country and basically look at it uh, as if it were a credit rating, uh, except it's a policy rating, and we can look at what the impact on the cost of electricity will look like so that when investors come in, then they know what kind of outcomes they're going to see. And the more we can uh, optimize that, the more, um, the more projects uh, these countries are going to, going to build. And, and with that, I think it's, uh, it would be really interesting to talk about what kind of bottlenecks are there when we talk about financial markets. Why isn't there more investment going into, uh, into renewables? Um, why isn't there a trillion dollars yet? Maybe, Harold, can you, can you walk us through it? Well, um, we heard in the previous panel, right, creating markets, and uh, if we want to mobilize the um, trillions, let's start out with billions, but <laughs> if we eventually want to go, we do really need to create the market. So let's perhaps, um, and, I, and I fully agree that, you know, one of the bottlenecks, just to answer to your question before, uh, the bottleneck is certainly that uh, 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 affordability still is not there. And, and if you look in, in, in some African countries, financing costs make up more than three quarters of the costs of solar energy, and that's not good enough because it shows also clearly that even if we make further progress in reducing technology costs of equipment, the problem is the financing costs. So we need to create these markets. We need to bring in... Financing. So let me perhaps answer here in, 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 in two phases. The first one is sort of a strategic consideration. What we should think of, look at an historic example. And secondly, I will tell you exactly what we want to do to be practical to achieve that in the coming years, right? Actionable. So um, as we are in New York, I looked a little bit, I uh, brushed up my history and I looked how the U.S. Treasury bond and bill market was created, which is now the deepest bond market in the world, and it's, it's, it's really fantastic. And, and the, one of the most favorite, uh, famous sons of this city, Alexander Hamilton, was really important. And, and, and there are two lessons. So first, the, there were clear rules established 
this is a, bit, a little bit what you said, Wilfredo, that a clear rule was established to make sure that the credit quality was there. The credit of the U.S. was established. And, uh, and secondly, you know, this sucked in new liquidity, that, that, uh, the, uh, and, and it also was what, what Alexander Hamilton then said, cemented the union, this large debt. So what can we learn from that for the solar market, the global solar market which we want to create? We need to work on the credit quality and, and, and establish rules. And this is what Wilfredo said before. We need to have standardization uh, in the regulatory part for solar PV. We need to have um, standardization in contracts. But then, you know, and the beautiful thing on solar PV is that uh, technically a solar plant in Mongolia looks very similar to a solar plant in Argentina. So, and then we have the standardized contracts, so beautiful. But, and wait, we have still very different macroeconomic regimes, macroeconomic risks, and this is where the third standardization initiative, which we are working on, is coming in. So what we want to do is homogenize financial risks and offer de-risking instruments for the investors so that they can invest in uh, solar assets. Right now we have tens of trillions of institutional assets invested in um, negative to zero yielding investments, very safe investments. And that, that is a result because institutional investors have very strict investment guidelines and they are very conservative about risk taking. And they need to deploy very large funds in a go. So they need deep markets. What, what we need to offer to them is a homogenized asset class, which is de-risk to their liking, so that they can deploy these funds. And when you have these investors to buy in, you will achieve a snowballing effect. Um, how are we going to do that? So we were asked, uh, TWI, TCX, which I'm representing, we are specialized uh, fund which provides FX currency hedges, the World Bank Group, ATI, uh, Agence France de Développement, a number of, of, of large financial institutions have been asked to prepare for the COP in Bonn a feasibility study on a global de-risking facility for solar PV. Um, we, will, we are making good progress. I cannot tell you all the details. We, this has to wait for, uh, for Bonn, obviously. But um, some principles and, and, and and um, this will work roughly. What are, what are the principles of this mechanism, which we uh, hope we will can uh, introduce in, in Bonn? Is first of all, we we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We, there are many de-risking tools already available. For example, MIGA from the World Bank is offering convertibility insurance. TCX has has FX uh, uh, foreign exchange risk management tools in all currencies in the world, with a few exceptions. Um, but these, these, uh, these instruments are not easily accessible for, for solar investors. So what we are proposing is a platform which gives easy access to all these various ri uh, providers of risk management tools. Um, secondly, we want to make this sustainable. If you want to mobilize billions and then eventually trillions, you need to have institutions which are uh, so financially sustainable. That means you need to price the risks to reflect the costs. It's a very important principle. And, um, and you know, in some countries, this will work very well, where the risks are relatively moderate. In other countries where risks are very high, we need to then probably think of alternative solutions as well. And last but not least, it will rely as any marketplace, on the interest of many people to come in, to willing to ded dedicate their time, dedicate their, their, uh, their capital, because they, ex they have a profit expectation. So, and this conference, and while, while I'm here, uh, is very much driven that, that we, we uh, inform other people on a global basis that we are doing that and hope that this may interest uh, them to work with us, and we are certainly very open to, to reach out and work. And, uh, and uh, in, in one month from now, I hope we can disclose the details. 
and thank you very much for allowing me to talk here. Yeah, I think uh, um, we're very grateful to have CTCX and the World Bank um, on board with the initiative. But um, we, as we build the momentum and as we start building and deploying those tools, uh, the most important part is for everybody to start coming together. Uh, so we uh, we start with 16 countries, but we ultimately need to to get everybody involved who is who is part of the of the Paris Agreement um, uh, for uh, the benefit for uh, and and the uh, important part for the corporate interest is that we are in the, we are watching an opportunity in front of us. It's a huge opportunity for innovation, uh, and we are at the very front of it. So that's really important as well for 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 our partners, and this initiative needs to expand to hundreds and hundreds of companies. Uh, and now is an opportunity to get engaged right at the, at the foundational uh, level with Terawatt. And then ultimately, the world global thinkers, our advisors are some of the most famous economists in the world, and, uh, and we continue to look for the great minds to join us. I think we should add just one thing, and it's a huge profit opportunity. I think this will not work without the opportunity that firms will make profit, and that will happen. And and uh, and I think that is very an important uh, fuel for to achieve the billions and trillions eventually. Maybe if I can add one more thing is um, the affordability of solar is already there because we have best-in-class countries who has already been achieving a great things in terms of making solar affordable. Now, I think the, uh, what we, we are raising here is how do we make it affordable for a large number of countries? And the tool, I mean, there are two legs to what we're proposing here is a natural de-risking mechanism via reform, regulatory reform, and then in addition to that, a financial de-risking uh, uh, de mechanism by combining the two, the, the, the intention is to make a large number of countries uh, using solar because it is affordable. On that note, I'd like to open the floor for any questions that anyone might have. Yes? Hi, uh, my name is Jerome Tagger, and I uh, work with Impact Alpha. We write about sustainable finance. Um, I mean, a few things first. Uh, so it sounds like uh, the initiative has already has been in the in the works for a, for a while now, or maybe a year and a half or so. Is that right? So um, uh, I'd love to also better understand where you are at this point. Uh, and you mentioned this is a time for uh, people to get involved at a foundational level. So who and to do what? Uh, what are the ongoing initiatives besides uh, the one you, you talked about on, on de-risking and specifically on finance? What are the plans beyond beyond this? Are you are you building a marketplace? I think I heard the word marketplace. Are you building investment vehicles? And so on and so forth. So before we answer the question, I'd like to take one more question from the floor and then we'll go on to the answers. Hi, I'm Dan Ferber. I'm with uh, Springer Nature, uh, science publisher. Uh, my question is, uh, to what extent does there, is there a need for more uh, technological development of solar PV to, uh, to expand these uh, markets? Um, that's basically it. That's a great question. Uh, so I'll take the last one first. Um, on the technology side, we're in a very, very good space. Uh, so from uh, the cost of photovoltaic has fallen by a factor of 20 in the last 10 years, the cost of batteries by a factor of four. So uh, we are, we're in fantastic space and it, it will continue to improve, but we actually don't need for it to improve. Um, even, even if it stayed right as it is, uh, and we, uh, we saw um, availability of finance, which we heard here accounts for sometimes two-thirds of the investment, we would be in really, really good shape in terms of the affordability and scalability of solar. Um, we will continue uh, to need um, uh, additional storage capacities, and the most value is actually going to come from the intelligence that will sit on top of the grid. Uh, and that, those are the services, the um, uh, energy services that we're going to continue to see expanding and, and probably exploding. And that is sharing of, uh, of energy, 
collaborative um, network, uh, networking, um, intelligent tra transport and robotics that are going to plug into the grid. So that's where we're going to see an explosion in, of innovation that's already happening, but it's going to continue to happen. Okay, do you guys uh, if I can just add to that. Um, uh, in addition to the, the, the fact that the manufacturing costs will be continue to decrease, there is also uh, a scale element which affects the cost of solar, meaning that more we build uh, large scale projects, more it is affordable because we reduce costs as well. In addition to the third element, which is the financing costs we're talking about here. I mean, to give us a specific example about the scale effects, you, we're seeing that already in East Africa with distributed energy, that people are need to build up distribution mechanisms, warehouses, and, and, and so on. And uh, these are investments, and they may feel more comfortable if they see that there is more sales coming in the future. So there, 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 there will be fantastic, uh, fantastic impact on, on the supply chain uh, if, if we increase the volume. Yeah. So that's uh, very that's important. Right. And, and uh, to the question about Terawatt as an organization, so uh, a little bit about history. It started originally during the Paris Agreement as the industry response. Um, industry, even back then, uh, the industry players wanted to participate, wanted to take part in, uh, in what was happening. And now we're seeing more and more industry players step in and basically say, especially in the United States, we see this a lot because of the of what's happening politically with respect to the to the Paris Agreement, as the United States trying to trying to withdraw. Um, the corporate leaders are, are stepping in and stepping in and saying, we will own the problem as well, which is fantastic. The issue is, is that as an individual company, the problem is bigger than any individual company. And companies usually uh, come at this problem uh, from the perspective of their, we've heard this from the previous session, from the arm of their sustainability arm. And the reality of the matter is, it's an economic question. It's a question of innovation for companies. It's a question of how they're going to transform to service their customers in the next 10 to 20 years. So it's very valuable, actually, for companies to come together to start creating these tools. Uh, when the initiative initially started, uh, the companies looked at it more from the perspective of how do we better understand the market, how do we better support this. Now it's about how do we transform ourselves as we transform the market. Because the market is going to transform, to transform whether we want it or not. How it's going to transform and how it's going to affect businesses and how businesses are going to affect it, that is something that we can shape and that is something we, we can change. And that's why we're asking. Uh, we. We're, uh, we're hoping that everybody, uh, all of the companies, start to engage now because that's, that's the right point in time. Everybody's already stepping up. Everybody's already starting to commit um, both uh, good intent and financial towards that. They need to, we need to join hands right now. It's very, very important. Otherwise, we're a little island. There's no networking effect. The second question that you asked is, what are the next things? So over the years, um, Terawatt started to transform into effectively an incubator for ideas that are scalable and can really horizontally affect the entire planet. So the first two big initiatives and two big ideas that uh, fundamental that will probably transform into their own uh, organizations is the uh, is the piece around financing, which uh, which Harold talked to us about it, and the, and the next one is the, the other one is about around policy. So think of it as a kind of a standards enforced uh, thought process around policy making. Uh, and what what's going to happen next is as we see this market evolve, again, this is little islands. Everybody is a little bit on their own island. They're struggling to find their market. We need to bring the players together. So the next generation of this, the next piece, is the digital platform that helps everybody get connected. Um, and the first piece of it is the financial piece where all the players can combine so you can create the value chain. So as a customer, I can come in and I can say, okay, I want to create a project. And what are all of the different components that I need to make that project happen? Today, it can take six years for a project like that to come to fruition. We need that time to cut off into the best of, best of breeds, six months or less. And, and maybe if I can just add to the... Uh, Terawatts, as Laila said, we, currently there are three initiatives. One is to, to, to propose a kind of standard a contract uh, where uh, 
available and there is a tax force who work on that. It is, it is, have been working, they have been working for, for a year. Uh, the second thing which is important is the evaluation tool which allows policy makers to see the impact of regulation into the goal to make solar affordable and to decide themselves which reform they want to make because they see the quantification of the impact of the reform, okay? And this is ongoing. We, uh, we work, uh, there is a task force who work on that. We, KPMG, Terawatt, uh, of course, and uh, three high, high street lawyers, such as Herbert Smith, Norton Rose, and Tri Legal, was joint force working on that, make it happen. And we, that's why we designed this criteria I mentioned earlier. We are run, running a poll of to uh, 5,000 uh, professionals to confirm that the initial view this task force have, have on this criteria and the weight in grading is still relevant. So we're waiting for that. When we get the result for that, these two will be presented to the COP23 in November. And then when it is presented, we can start interaction with government and policy make makers so they can acti actually use this tool. And this will be also available to financial investors because they can use that to assess the country risk in each country they decide to go to. And, and uh, in, in the financial tool, right, what the um, contributions which we are looking for are, let's distinguish between the various stakeholder groups. The one stakeholder are state actors, and there you have donor governments and you have recipient governments. And they will they be asked to contribute different things. For recipient governments, we'll work very much with the standardization initiatives to accept a certain regulatory framework to, to harmonize their regulations uh, um, to do potentially other reforms, uh, and, and donor countries may have also their views what they want to achieve, what priorities, political priorities they have. Then we have another stakeholder groups which are institutional investors. We need to, in order to be successful, we need to hear very clearly what they need in order to then, because they at the end need to be satisfied with the services and invest uh, and, and, and be willing to invest. We are working also with institutional investors, for example, there's the Climate Bond Initiative, where we are trying to see, work with the, the, this, this um, a group to see what, uh, uh, what can help to package the assets then, aggregate assets in the future. So I'm going to just pause here because I can see the level of passion from our panelists and in the room. So I will invite you all to follow up and to, to watch the space. Uh, and I would like to thank all of you, uh, my panelists, for joining us, for sharing this incredible passion you have for uh, accelerating energy decarbonization. And everyone uh, online, thank you for joining us. I'm closing the press conference. Thank you.